Good morning. Does everybody have some coffee? Is everybody awake? Uh, maybe a little bit more caffeine is still probably needed here. But I'm going to give you some lightning talks that are going to get you all energized for the last day of talks here at PyCon. Woo! <laughs> you might have had enough coffee this morning. Just saying. All right, first up we have Joshua and Cynthia talking about Zulipbot and improving the GitHub workflow. Good morning, everyone. I'm Joshua Pan. And I'm Cynthia Lin. And today we're talking about Zulipbot, an open source bot application we made, named after the organization that we first developed it for. If you're using GitHub for open, your open source projects, Zulipbot improves your GitHub workflow. Zulubot works around the limitations and defaults in GitHub's model by creating a way more democratic workflow for contributors. It lets contributors manage labels, claim issues, and easily grow from new contributors to co-maintainers of busy projects. One example of a limitation in GitHub's model is issue assignment. One common way to keep track of who's working on what in a large project is to assign issues to contributors. But GitHub's issue tracker has a binary model of repository ownership. It only allows contributors with full write access to the repository to assign themselves issues and abandon their own issues, as well as do the same thing for other contributors. Most projects don't want to give new and uh, experienced contributors full write access to a repository, but we do not want people to s actually waste their time and say, this is what we're working on, or this is, I'm not working on this anymore. So we fix most of these problems by creating the Zulubot claim and abandon commands that allow um, contributors to comment these two commands on the issues and self-assign themselves issues or, and release your assignments. A related subject is issue triage. Since issue, uh, users without full write access cannot label issues, we created a Zulubot label command for issue creators that want to label their own issues appropriately. With this feature, you can spread the uh, workload among the community easier, including members that might be great at issue triage but not so great at merging code into the master branch. Another thing that uh, GitHub has problems with is the notification system. So GitHub's notification system has no direct way for you to subscribe to a subset of issues or pull requests. Uh, so either you get only you only get notified about the items you've already participated in, or you get the whole fire hose, which means like over 100 emails per day for an active project. And so Zulipbot's notification system lets um, maintainers to create uh, area label teams. Um, this builds on the way GitHub uh, lets organizations use GitHub teams. In Zulip, contributors can join teams based on their fields of expertise ranging from refactoring to analytics to documentation. Whenever someone labels an issue with an area label, um, starting with area, Zulipbot notifies the members of the corresponding area team to check out that new issue. Similarly, when a pull request references an issue that is labeled with an area label, Zulipbot notifies the corresponding area team to ask them to review the pull request. For example, on Zulip, we have Area settings UI, area stream settings, area labels, and those correspond to the server settings area team. This system creates a more collaborative and efficient workflow, allowing contributors to quickly respond to new pull requests and issues uh, that arise within their field of expertise, which is ideal for an open source project. One issue that has also caused um, is our merge conflicts. Um, when a pull request develops a merge conflict, GitHub UI shows that, but nobody is actively notified. This is severely annoying for reviewers trying to conduct a review only to find a pull request with the merge conflict that needs to be rebased against the master branch. Zulubot notices that there's a merge conflict and immediately notifies the authors of the pull request. 
Similarly, um, contributors also have to deal with inactive issues and pull requests. Sometimes life sucks and you don't have the time or energy to continue working on an issue that you've claimed or a pull request that you've opened and you disappear off of the face of the earth. At least that's what it seems like to the core developers of the project you contributed to. So Zillabot automates inactivity checks to uh, make sure that everything's going well. It fetches all issues and pull requests in a given repository that haven't been updated for a customizable amount of time. And then they, it reminds the slumbering contributor to return to their issue or pull request. And if an issue still hasn't been updated even after Zillabot posted an activity warning, uh, Zillabot automatically removes the assigned contributor from the issue after a certain period of time, allowing other contributors to put up the open issue. Finally, Zillabot gives you a lot of configurability with 25 different features. And yes, you can configure its GitHub username and password. And it, it's 100% open source. If you are interested in using Zillabot, you can find us and chat with us now or swing by Zillabot's development sprints. We'll be there all four days. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Next up, we have Leonard with your keyboard, your most important tool. Yes, this is a real typewriter. No, you can't go out and buy it. <laughs> your fingers and your keyboard is what sits between your brain and your code. Your keyboard needs to be adapted to you. And it needs adaptation to you, not only so you can type quickly and accurately, but also so you can do it all day long without hurting yourself. So how did you select your keyboard? Are you using the keyboard that came with the computer? Or did you choose it because it has sharp angles and a Z in the name? <laughs> Is it really adapted to you? How many in here use touch typing? Hands up. Lots of people use touch typing. Look at this picture that's showing how you're supposed to use touch typing. Where, where is this guy's arms? Is he typing like this? You know, attached to the chest? That's not how you sit when you touch type. You sit like this with your hands at an angle, and that's bad for your wrists. If you're using touch typing, you shouldn't use the standard straight keyboards. You should get an ergonomic keyboard that lessens this angle properly. You might even go the whole way and get a Kinesis keyboard. If you come to the sprints, and you should come to the sprints, you will see several people dragging these around. They're apparently awesome because people are fanatical about them. Um, but I don't touch type, so for me and for other touch typists in general, these kind of keyboards are just annoying. Any keyboard that has a split. So we use the standard straight ones. And do you have a numerical keypad on your keyboard? Uh, a lot of people don't use the numerical keyboard, keypad very often, but it's there because IBM created the standard keyboard layout that everybody's using, and they created it for mainframe terminals and for using it with Lotus 123. So you need to type in a lot of numbers, so you had a numerical keypad. But it makes the keyboard wider and it forces you to hold your arm too far to the right when you're using the mouse. This can lead to shoulder pain, especially if you have narrow shoulders like most women do. So yeah, the IBM keyboard is sexist. <laughs> but you probably don't use it that much and then it's just in the way. But if you go to the shop, the normal computer shop around the store, um, around the corner, uh, the keyboards they have without numerical keypads are usually mini keyboards with mini keys and you can't use them to program. So the common name for a full-size keyboard that does not have a numerical keypad is 10 keyless. That took a while to figure out. Um, so if you don't use the numerical keyboard a lot, that's probably what you want and you're probably going to have to buy it online. And then it comes to the question, what kind of key switches should you have? Because there's lots and lots of them. And there's three main types, and they're called linear, tactile, and clicky. Linear means that the force you use when you press down the key gets linearly more higher when the further down you press the key. <clears throat> 
uh, tactile has a shape to the force curve that you can see here, where the, sh where the force goes up a little bit for a while and then dips down and then goes up again. And somewhere in that dip, the key is actually getting pressed. That means you get tactile feedback to if you have pressed the key or not. Uh, and that's pretty nice. Most people like that, but not everybody. And the last is clicky, and that's a keyboard that gives an audible click when you press it. A lot of people like that, but you can't really use it in, in an office setting. Uh, they were designed for offices that had actually typewriters in them. They, we don't do that anymore. All right, and lastly, I want everybody to stretch their hands up. And you stretch your fingers out, and you bend the top down, and you stretch out, and you make a fist. Stretch your fingers out, make a table. Stretch your fingers out, thumbs up, and stretch your fingers out. This is a nice warm up before you start coding to prevent carpal tunnel syndrome and similar things. If you want to know more about keyboards and keyboard switches, go to DeskThorities wiki. They have everything. It's insane. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. And can I just say cherry blue switches? Really nice if you want to annoy your office mates. All right, next we have Hugo with Live Code Reloading with Reloader. Good morning, Python. I hope you're doing well this morning, this early morning. Um, so we'll talk to you about how you can do Live Code Reloading in Python. Uh, but first, I will start with demo, because that's the best way to explain uh, what I'm trying to achieve. So. On the, the right here, you can see uh, just some piece of code that draws uh, a sphere. Uh, so if I launch this code, uh, it shows me two spheres, as you can see here. Um, and that's all fine, but if I want to tweak a bit with it, uh, for example, I want to change the color, I will have to ch edit the code. So I need to change my code, escape, uh, and then run the code again so I can play a bit with it. And this is really annoying because if I want to play a lot with my Python code, I don't want to start my app every time. Maybe I need to uh, change the state a bit. So what I would do is I would uh, just install this library called Reloader, which I already have installed. Then I would import it. So from Reloader, import auto reload. And finally, I just add this decorator in my class. So if I launch um, my app again, and I start to make changes, I should have the changes appearing directly uh, in Python. So if I decide to change my code and only display the wires, I only display the wires. Uh, this means I can change the behavior. For example, I want to change the colors over time. I could um, just, I'm using this T0 attribute on my instances that say when they got started, so I could have a sign waves that give me, so this gives me a, basically a value between zero and one that changes over time. And if I use it as the color of my sphere, you can see it's directly changing. Uh, I don't need to restart anything. It's just live reloading in Python. It works with classes. It works with functions. Um, no, you don't always want to do that. When it's u it's used mainly useful when you have a stateful application where you want to maintain the state. If you took time to load data, if you took time to launch your app, you're in a video game, you want to customize a specific dynamic behavior, or if you need many user interactions, then it can be really useful to do uh, hot code reloading. Um, so to use it in your program, all you have to do is, uh, from reloader import auto reload, decorate your function or decorate your class, it will just work. Uh, the way it works, it, it will inspect, uh, use the inspect to get the, so to the path of the file where your piece of code, your function or your class is defined. 
Then you will use a library called Red Baron to extract just the piece of code from that function. So if you have while true below your class, below your function, it will still work. You don't, it's not like, it, it will just pick the part you changed, you decorated, not the rest of your module. You can change the rest, it will still work. Um, and then we'll execute that piece of source code inside the namespace of the module, uh, get the new class from that namespace, and then it will, if you have a function, it will, in fact, the decorator returns you a proxy function and it will replace the target function. So the proxy will now use the new version of the function. And if you have a class, uh, the decorator will keep a weak reference to all of the instances of your class. It will replace the underscore underscore class uh, of all of these instances. Uh, and because it's weak references, that your objects can still be garbage collected. Uh, so thanks for uh, looking at it. If you want to try it, you just pip install reloader, or you can check the GitHub repository, or uh, tweet me if you have comments about it. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Don with Pascal's Wager and you. Good morning. How are you doing, PyCon? It's really early. Um, my name is Don Goodman Wilson. I'm a developer advocate at Screen. We do security for your web application, and I want to talk to you a little bit about security. In particular, I want to talk to you about this argument that I hear from a number of early stage startups, which goes something like this. The probability of our startup getting hacked in a way that's significant or debilitating is extremely low. Very tiny. So we're not going to invest in it. I want to talk about the fact that this is a terrible, terrible argument, and I'm going to do this by talking about this guy. So this is Blaise Pascal, 17th century French mathematician and theologian, uh, and he was also concerned about a low probability event, the existence of God. Um, in particular, uh, he was very interested in applying math to uh, develop an argument for why you should believe in God, because he believed that there is no possible evidence for or against God's existence, so this is not an empirical question. He was really interested in reasoning under uncertainty and is one of the founders of modern decision theory as we use it today. Uh, and so he said, well, rather than thinking about God's existence in terms of empirical evidence, let's treat it as a wager, right? We are betting with our lives as to whether God exists. When we do that, we can bring to bear a very interesting mathematical framework that we can use to decide whether or not we should believe in God. We can create uh, uh, basically a payoff matrix. So along the top, we have the two possible bets that we can place. We can bet on God's existence. We can bet against God's existence. On the right, we have the possible outcomes of this bet. God exists or God doesn't exist, right? Let's ignore the probabilities for just a moment and look at what the payoffs look like. If we bet on God or we bet against God and God doesn't exist, we can either gain nor lose. Let's call this zero. Um, if we bet on God and God exists, we get, he's Catholic, bear in mind, right, we get eternal everlasting life in heaven. Uh, but if we bet against God, uh, we get eternal everlasting uh, damnation in hell. And he treats these as, as infinite payoffs, right? So betting on God, God exists, we get infinite utility. Uh, if we bet against God and God exists, uh, we get infinite disutility. Now, any fraction of infinity is infinity, right? So regardless of what the probability distribution over God's existence looks like, we should bet on God because the payoff, the expected payoff is infinite. Well, I didn't come here to talk to you about God. Uh, I came here to talk to you about security. Uh, so I'm going to offer a similar wager. So we really can't know with what probability uh, some debilitating hack to your startup is going to happen. Let's call it really low. Let's call it infinitesimal even, but it's not zero. So I want to argue that we're betting with our startup's existence as to whether or not we'll suffer a debilitating hack. And guess what? We can build a payoff matrix, right? We can bet on security. We can bet against it. We might not get hacked. We might get hacked. Let's ignore the probabilities for a moment. If we bet on security and we never get hacked, meh. If we bet against security and we never get hacked, meh. If we bet on security and somebody does try to hack us and we stop it and we detect it, pretty happy. That's not bad, that's not a bad, maybe not infinitely happy, but happy. On the other hand, if we bet against security and we suffer a debilitating hack by its very definition, a debilitating hack is something that destroys our startup, we are infinitely sad. We can apply the same magic. What's any fraction of negative infinity? It's negative infinity, right? So the utility of betting against security is uh, uh, negative infinity. Therefore, we should bet 
on security. Uh, what does it mean to bet on security? I, I, wanna, I wanna talk about this for just a moment. The CTO security checklist is a vendor neutral uh, checklist that we provide uh, for whatever stage your company is at. We offer you actionable uh, advice that is going to be effective uh, in uh, improving the security of your web application. So if you wanna vote or if you wanna bet on security, uh, have a look at this checklist. It's gonna help you out uh, tremendously. Thank you, I'm Don Goodman Wilson. Uh, enjoy the rest of your morning. Thank you. Next up, we have Paul with Time Zone Tools. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Paul Gansel. I work for Bloomberg, uh, but uh, probably more relevant for this talk uh, is uh, for the past two years, I've been uh, maintaining the library Date Util. Um, so I'm just gonna you know, try and wake everybody up with the most rousing of things, a dry talk about time zones with no pictures. So. So I, I recently did a revamp of some of, some of the time zone handling in uh, daytime, uh, and I thought that I would try and uh, convey some of the things I've learned about how Python uh, expects time zones to work and how they actually work. So uh, the most important concept when you're trying to understand Python's time zone interface is uh, that tzinfo subclasses, or objects uh, instantiated from tzinfo subclasses, uh, they are intended to provide the UTC offset, the daylight savings time, and a printable time zone name as a function of the date, right? So each TZ info object is a rule for how to get these uh, pieces of information from the date. So as an example, this is uh, using uh, uh, DateUtils uh, time zone interface. I first get the, uh, the, uh, the time zone for New York City. I attach it to this date, um, and I'm gonna just construct this other date by adding one day to it. Uh, and if you look, I use this helper function to print out these pieces of information. Uh, the first one says EDT minus four and one hour. The second one says EST minus five and then zero hours. Uh, but the TZ info object is exactly the same. It's the same object. That, um, so the way this is handled in DateUtil and PyTZ is a little bit different. So DateUtil sort of tries to stick to this interface. It, it provides uh, time zone objects that directly will uh, you know, return these pieces of information as a function of the date. PyTZ, for very good historical reasons, and obviously I'm biased towards date detail, but I'm gonna say some very nice things about PyTZ. They, for many, many years, were the only ones doing this right, essentially. But it's a little confusing. So if you try and use whatever the standard uh, library docs says to do and just attach a PyTZ time zone, uh, what you're gonna get is this weird thing. LMT, which stands for local mean time, UTC offset minus 4.93 hours. Uh, that's obviously wrong, right? That was not the TZ, uh, time zone offset in 2012. Uh, what you're actually supposed to do is do this uh, PyTZ time zone dot localize function. Uh, and what that's gonna do is uh, PyTZ is going to create on the fly a new static object that always returns EDT minus four and one. So it's not the same object as the, as the time zone that you first constructed. Uh, and they have some fancy caching below uh, this, uh, behind the scenes to make sure that this is a, an efficient way to do things. Um, so I said that they were the only ones doing it correctly for the first you know, 10 years or so, right? Um, but as of Python 3.6, there is now an official uh, appropriate way to do this. And the reason why PyTZ does this, in fact, is because of these things called ambiguous times, right? So an ambiguous time, is a time in a time zone where the wall time is exactly the same for two separate sort of timestamps, right? You, uh, epoch times. Uh, so for example, here, uh, on like Halloween 2004, uh, there were two 130s, right? Before, there was no way to represent that because it, the, the thing that, you, that the TZ info is taking as a function is the same, uh, but it's supposed to give two different offsets. Um, that's why PyTZ had this localized function because that allowed them to specify one or the other. But in Python 3.6, they introduced uh, PEP495, which um, adds this fold attribute. So this is the fold attribute, and this basically makes it so that you can have a daytime object that specifies which side of the fold you're on, so which one of the two ambiguous times you're at. Um, so 
this sort of solves this problem and now lets us use the standard Python interface even when dealing with ambiguous and imaginary times. Obviously I didn't get into imaginary times, but if you talk to me later I can talk for hours and hours about imaginary times. Um, and if you're not quite up on 3.6 yet, uh, we have this, uh, in DateUtil, we, we provide this uh, enfold method, which gives you some measure of backwards compatibility. Uh, unfortunately, after I was like, wow, I got total backwards compatibility, uh, someone brought up a bug that's kind of subtle, and now I'm like, I don't know if I can really say it's backwards compatible. So, um, all right, so that's the end of my talk. Uh, if you're interested in helping out with DateUtil development, uh, we could use some polish and uh, you know, if it's your first pull request against open source uh, project, like it, I would be very happy to help guide you through that. So uh, yeah, thanks. With four seconds to spare, you really do no time. <laughs> I had to make that joke, right? All right, next up we have Paul and Laura with the state of Pi Video. <laughs> so Pi Video is a community run website that's an index of Python videos. We index videos from PyCon and regional PyCons all over the world. This is our wonderful start page with our most recent videos up. We have events and index, we have all of our events indexed, so if you did hallway track, you can always catch the talks later. And we also have videos organized by tags. We are a community-driven site. We are an open source project, so if you are looking for something to sprint with or contribute to, you are more than welcome to join us. Um. Great plug. <laughs> all right, how we doing? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah! Wow, okay, so those, uh, those uh, cupcake quiches are really kicking down, right? Um, okay, so who do we service? <clears throat> we touch a lot of countries. This is probably my most favorite slide of all the slides that we have. Um, it gives you an indication of the countries that we've touched and you know, proportional how many people in those countries we've touched. Um, we've, in the past month, touched 147 countries. Now, over our, uh, the past year, we've touched uh, 197, which is impressive uh, because there's only 196 countries worldwide. So um, <laughs> we're really breaking through that glass ceiling here. Um, we've had over 15K sessions, uh, 10K users, almost 30,000 page views, and this is all just for the past month. Um, and about 70% of those are new users. So people coming to our site for the first time or at least coming to our site with a different device, right? Um, how does it work? We scrape the web for this type of information. We put it into a JSON-like object uh, or just a JSON object. Uh, there are all files, uh, so flat files that hold these JSON blobs. Those get merged into this data repo. That data repo is a sub-repo of the PyVideo repo. Um, and whenever a merge happens, uh, basically, uh, the deployment is automatically done, so our uh, site is updated as soon as somebody merges in new data. So it makes it super quick, super easy to maintain. Um, why am I telling you this? Well, it makes it super easy for you to become a contributor. If you want to add back and touch 197 countries, right, you can do that. Just help us out by making these JSON blobs. Instructions are online. Go to GitHub and check us out. It's very easy. Uh, we designed it so that you can get up and running with your development environment in less than five minutes, okay? Uh, if you can't do that, let me know. We're, we're working on making sure that's as easy as possible for you. Um, you can see that there's a lot of helpers here. This is not an exhaustive list, but uh, it's the best that I can do with uh, Git history um, and Git blame. And uh, a little bit of what we need. We'll be here around uh, during sprints, so please you know, find us if you want to help out. Uh, what we need is manual labor. It's really going out and building the tools to do the scraping or using the tools that we've already built to do the scraping. Um, who are we especially looking for to help out with this? If you're running a conference, a local conference, you're probably in a great position to have really nicely formatted data, say, from a CSV. Um, that's going to make everybody's life a lot easier in getting that data into PyVideo. So it'd be great if you could reach out. Um, yeah, always looking to catalog new sources, and we're thinking about switching to YAML if that, inter if that excites anybody. So um, I, saw, I heard one lone clap in the back, so <laughs> maybe not too excited. 
Uh, but either way, uh, it's possibly happening. So uh, again, a thank you and reach out if you have any questions. Well, that's it for Lightning Talks. Uh, thank you to all of our Lightning Talks speakers. Uh, we, well, we wouldn't have Lightning Talks without our speakers. So if you could give, us, uh, give our speakers one more round of applause. And uh, I think I, we have like a minute break as we transition over to keynotes. <laughs>